Chris, thank you. And thank you for organising this. Um, it's been a terrific couple of days. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I know you are up quite late dealing with technology um, and you make it all look so seamless and easy. So I'm sure many people would think the same. And thank you all uh, who have gone before. Uh, your papers have been um, stimulating, difficult, um, entertaining, um, challenging. And I have a slight change of inflection on uh, my title, although reading, reconnecting and religion, the vertical and the horizontal still remain um, what I seek to talk about. But I'm also um, offering you an additional uh, title, uh, changing, challenging titles, um, because that's where uh, these remarks ended up. So you'll see behind me on the board, um, I have eliminated uh, the universal and the existential uh, quantifiers and substituted <laughs> um, substituted um, a three-part um, uh, uh, outline of what the remarks, um, roughly speaking, do. So there's an opening, which I will uh, advance to shortly. Uh, a series of interruptions, which seemed only too suitable uh, in the circumstances. And then an inconclusive conclusion. And I'm not absolutely sure um, quite how much of this I'll read. They're kind of two or possibly three versions. Um, and it depends how slowly I read, how tired I am, how you all look. Um, uh, so thank you very much, Chris, um, for the dubious honour of being the last honour. <laughs> <laughs> so um, three, a brief set of remarks under three headings, opening, interruptions, and by way of concluding. As indicated in my abstract, my main aim was to respond to the posthumous text for Lille Le Relier. And this I propose to do by drawing on the 1980 book, The Parasite, which has been much discussed in the last few days. And indeed, the conversations with Bruno Latour from 1992, Eclaircissement. Uh, the trajectory of my discussion results from an attempt to think through inserting the term religion into the series of terms, interference, noise, parasitism, and so religion would take the fourth place uh, there in due course when I've um, concluded um, my remarks. Serre oddly claims that this new book, Relier le Relier, uh, uh, that he's not previously treated religion, although to me it seems plausible to claim that the books of foundations, Rome, statues, and the origins of geometry are all about religion as practice and institutions, or perhaps about the religious. Their attempt to trace a religiousness at work across three distinct registers, the foundation of Rome, the conversion of stone into statues, the invention of a universalizing idealization in geometry constitutes in part their strangeness. And a distinction between invoking religion and invoking the religious will arrive in due course for attention. First interruption, reinventing the longitudinal. Uh, for a long time, I've been perplexed by the ambiguous appeal of the writings of Michel Serre and by the relation, almost a non-relation, from his writings to more common acceptations of the nature and practices of philosophy. These themes are addressed and avoided in equal parts in discussions with Bruno Latour in Ecclesiasmo, uh, prosaically translated into English in 1995 as Conversations on Science, Culture and Time. These conversations provide a first interruption of my reading and offer two clues for responding to Serre now treating religion in Relier le Relier. The assertion by Serre in the first conversation of the importance for him of the agonistics of Simone Weil, 1999 to 1943, which Vera talked about this morning, and in particular of her understanding of the violence of humanity, the violences of humanity. And a second sense that Serre their names of a certain Cathar inheritance, a resistance to and a history of persecution by the unifications and dogmatisms of a certain French Catholicism, which all the same remains important to him. In parallel mode of self-declaration, I should identify myself perhaps as the granddaughter of the grandson 
of a founder of a certain strand of Unitarianism in Massachusetts, USA, uh, the Rev Reverend William James Potter of New Bedford, Massachusetts, 1829 to 1893, who had emancipated himself from a perceived narrowness and constraint of a certain constricting Quakerism, in part by traveling to and studying in Berlin and Tübingen, amongst other places, in the 1850s. It's a detail which I think Michelle Sayer would have appreciated. For me, manoeuvres delimiting philosophy proper have always been of compelling concern. Uh, the border and barriers between philosophy and other disciplines are policed with an exceptional rigour for reasons which I think deserve our attention. As a more analytically inclined philosophical friend remarked to me on a hearing that Sayre is interested in angels, he won't be joining an Oxford philosophy faculty reading list any time soon. With Sayre, in the main, the reader will find neither the pursuit of a consequential argument from premises to conclusions, nor the detailed and careful analysis of current concepts to reveal what should rather be said and thought. Two of the chosen methods of practicing philosophers. In place of axioms and hypotheses, he pursues inquiries by way of analogies and postulates, sideways movements and self-interruptions of carefully designed force. Latour persuades him in a classy small to discuss the functions and status of the quasi object as deployed in section four of the parasite and to address the emphasis on a primacy of relation over substance in the identification of entities and matters for discussion. Rereading the parasite then would be a second interruption, the first interruption being rereading Eclaircissement in response to Relier le Relier. There's a contrast to be drawn between the modeling of philosophy as a game of chess in which the player takes on all possible opponents with a long history of possible gambits, as opposed to the flow of a team game such as rugby, much invoked in the course of the last two days, as indeed discussed by Latour and Serre, when the task is to find the right pass, connection, movement at the right time. Latour is questioning Sale both on the strange status of his writings and about the barriers they present to any readership, both French and English speaking. Sale replies by indicating that since the social sciences write only of human beings and the natural sciences write as though there are no human beings, there's a radical need for a new register of inquiry and discussion which would reconnect the social sciences to a wider context of ecological conditions of natural disaster and climate crisis, and a parallel need to reintroduce considerations of humanity in all its diversities into the range of concerns of the so-called hard sciences. Medical um, explorations would be a good place to look for the disaster of supposing there's only one model of the human. Sayre has a lapidary aside in the fifth conversation the one a world without people, the other people without a world. That's Ecclesiastes More 254, Raw Conversations, page 179. Sayre is proposing a different kind of formalization through which to bring the two domains together, focused on innovation, and he proposes modes of transitioning from domain to domain to reveal linkages where there is more, supposed, more usually supposed to be division. So this new kind of formalization is discussed in Ecclesiastes and indeed in Relier le Relier. Um, and I'm suggesting the notion of the longitudinal as a way of thinking about it. And then when Vera talked about the meridian this morning, um, I thought I'd just mark that there was a connection. <laughs> the surprise perhaps is that Sayre was surprised to be treated with suspicion or more simply ignored by the leaders of the profession of his time. Latour points out that from a practice on the periphery of the history of the discipline, his then most recent books, The Five Senses, 85, and Le Thiers Three, uh, The Instructed Third, 91, have departed from all known disciplinary distinctiveness. And yet, there is general agreement here 
that there's a certain stimulating consistency across the longitudinal lines of his inquiries. And just one remark from Relier Le Relier in support that this is also the view of Michel Serre from under the heading Partitions in a Map of the World. Uh, this is in the French at 212, in English at 165. Since any particular line meets all the other lines, the network of total parts represent the world, this viscous kingdom, like a formal model but in a solid state. The bonds of the preceding chapters, vertical and horizontal respectively, form the warp and weft of this network. So this is a remark from his part three of Relier le Relier, and this notion of warps and wefts in a network is also to be found in Parasite, amongst other places. So here's there, a, there is an announcement of a different kind of formalization, one which follows the uneven contours of its domain of interest, and I guess in the state of the globe the uneven contours of the surface of the globe. These longitudinal lines are emergent in Relier Le Relier out of a contrast brought to the fore, his last posthumous monograph, between vertical and horizontal dimensions and their points of intersection, which he identifies as constituting this warp and weft for tracing out a tissue of relations which are provisionally to be called religion. The first section of his book on the vertical dimension explores a series of movements between concepts of humanity and of divinity, a transcending move departing from earthbound constraining points and registering arrivals of other kinds of energy onto the surface on which we find ourselves. He writes in terms of hot spots and the turning points on parabolic curves. The horizontal dimension consists in histories of sacrifice and judgment, which are developed by him through contrasts between town and country life and in the parasite in terms of metropolis and province, capital city and colony, and all the various divisions emergent between human beings. He states in Relier le Relier that the insection between these two vectors in Christianity gets called the incarnation. The subheading of his second section, Horizontal Bindings, reads Relier les hommes, violence et amour, force Dieu, violence et l'amour, reconnecting human beings, violence and love, false gods, violence and death. He suggests that the human violence is emergent from it, from ill will and from mishap are to be converted back into affirmations of force and of energy, thus converting the false gods of human violence and a preoccupation with death into an affirmation of circulating energetics of love, attraction, repulsion. Towards the end of his third section, under the title The Problem of Evil, he describes Jerome taming the lion and concludes his discussion of this image of Jerome taming the lion with the imperative, effacer la machance, conserver la force, en le rien which gets put into English as, we must do away with malice while preserving its force, redirecting it to serve benign purposes. Um, thus losing the imperative tense and the echo of Voltaire's écraser l'infâme, so better would be efface wickedness and conserve its force in reorienting it. So there's a bit of a problem there already. So then remarks, in speaking of the plane of horizontal imminence where violence roams and of the vertical volume where peace roams, I cannot but help regret that psychoanalysts have appropriated the term sublimation for if it could be stripped of its pathological connotation, it would describe exactly what this passage from the one to the other involves. A passage then from the horizontal of human violence to the vertical of a divine peace. And so his distance from a certain psychoanalytical tradition may be yet another reason why it's been problematical to incorporate him into some notion of French theory, which I think we should continue to um, uh, support that he should not be that incorporated. 
So the question is how to read him without incorporating in, him into an unhelpful, anglicised North American notion of French theory. A contrast here is emerging between a plane of imminence, the horizontal, and a vertical volume, and this will deserve our further attention. The transfer from the imperative tense of sales into the must of obligation, maybe I better read that English translation again. We must do away with malice, whereas it's effacé, la méchanceté, while preserving its force. The transfer from the imperative tense of Sayers French into the must of obligation is also important for me. With Latour in Eclaircissement, Sayers has discussed at some length the conversion of the claim that must implies can into a contrary claim that can implies a must for humanity to take responsibility for our capacity to intervene in the global flourishing and imper imperiling of life on the planet. For Sayer in Ecclesiastes More, religion remains a general name for an under-theorized domain in which to consider and bind together a longer history of the humanities, which he supposes have been erased in the favor of something called the social sciences. He surmises that a longer history of the humanities gets foreclosed and cried out in favor of a set of more recently invented social sciences which focus on quantification and policy formation. And by contrast, he's proposing to reveal links, this is still in 1992, between the inventions of Lucretius and Pascal for which the religious and the scientific are not so starkly opposed, or an opposition which a distinction between the hard and the soft sciences seems to reaffirm. Sarah remarks there, that the history of the sciences may indeed gain from studying the histories of religions, and I take it he probably there means Christianity, for the manner in which schism and dispute generate both advance and needless destructiveness in relations between human beings. However, in Relier le Relier, religion also becomes the site for a meditation for Serre on his own life as an autopoiesis, as a self-formation of an utterly distinctive human sensibility and set of capacities, which has consumed itself in the writing of so many books of such startling variety. At the start of this third section, he remarks that he would not have dared write a book on religion had he not committed to a certain syncretism or the requirement of a grand récit. He reflects on how up until this book, he has not focused on religion, which he seeks now to, to add to the list of money, language, and science as a fourth site for registering the arrival of hot spots and the formation of turning points, sommet de réseau, in human destiny. And he observes, I have therefore wished to complete this program before I die by rereading the religions of my culture Greco-Roman paganism, Judaism, and Christianity, hence the present book. I miss the religion of my adolescence. I remain inconsolable at having lost it by way of thinking while retaining it in my life and my conduct. How then in this small coin to return to Christianity, the treasures which reactivate my youth? This is religion, page 166, Relier, Relier, 213. While this is inscribed under the heading Vide Lacunae, it overflows with an excess of implication, which overdetermine any communicated sense. Two strands in particular come to the fore. He's reflecting on being a Christian while no longer being a Christian. He's also interrupting the finality of his own death, foretold, on a horizontal plane by an affirmation of what has given his life meaning. Further interruptions, translation into English. But at this point, a further and more decisive interruption occurs. The arrival of the translation of our text into English, published just now by Stanford University Press, presumably in a delayed recognition that he had been at Stanford all those years. This arrival may halt further discussion. 
This is the noisy arrival at the door discussed by him in the series of extended transpositions in The Parasite. The arrival of this translation made urgent a revising of the process and progress of putting Sayre's thinking into circulation in the English-speaking world and to consider the capacity or the incapacity of English to accommodate the subtle suppleness of his thinking. There are, I think, also distinctions to be made between British English, transatlantic English, Antipodean Englishes, and all the English-speaking inheritors of the British Empire, which are simultaneously pragmatically accepting the constraints of their local conditions in which they emerge, and in haste to communicate a meaning to the wider domain of the English-speaking world. Already in 1982, with the translation of the parasite into English, uh, the disappearance of the third meaning of the notion of the parasite is already marked. Sayre returns in the closing passages of his most recent text, L'Ile Relier, to the question of the bouc émissaire, um, which he had also, of course, discussed in The Parasite. From the translation of The Parasite, we learn that in French, but not in English, parasite may also mean the noise, the interference, the static, on a system of transmitting messages which becomes inseparable from that message. The use of feedback loops in musical performance becomes an intrinsic part of the performance itself, and two further questions arise as a consequence. Under what title do we now read this text? It's called, as you see, religion. <laughs> or do we uh, insist on the notion of relier, le relier? Rereading Ecclesis More, I was struck by an analogy between the manner in which Serre there detonates meanings in his response to Latour, in a mode parallel to his insistence on hotspots of global and climatic catastrophe in Relier le Relier, an example from the latter. We have long believed that the fires of science produce less violence than those of religion. We were mistaken. Religion, page 10, Relier, page 20. In the translation, there's a really interesting elision of a first-person pronoun. In the second sentence where Serre appears to have written, we were mistaken, what he says in French is, je et nous nous trompons, I and we have deceived ourselves. And he is exploring his claim. By analogy then, I call hotspots, those places where at a given moment, another world manifests itself in ours those concrete images of contact with another reality, be it virtual, intelligent, spiritual, inspirational, perhaps dangerous as well. I'm going to skip the question of the change in the uh, illustrations on the front cover to which we might return. Um, we have on our left the adoration of the Magi. We have on our right Augustine in his cell. Um, uh, which um, I'm happy to talk a bit more about. Now, just uh, recap the two contentions which have emerged so far. The first contention is that the arrival of the word religion on the cover of the English translation fetishizes what Sale would rather have us dissolve back into an open system of exchanges of opinions, inventions of concepts and genres, returns to and retrievals of what has not so far featured so prominently in the linear narratives of progresses on human knowing and understanding. This would then continue a practice of disrupting boundaries between the researches of scientists and the formations of mythology, between the disciplines of anthropology and of philosophy, between the orderings of music and mathematics. These, of course, Sayre himself dissolves back into a series of exchanges, mathematical and musical, metaphorical and visual, and between the Christianity, Catholic and Latin of his youth and the Greek and Roman paganisms, which are so important for his thinking and transitions in the various books we all have variously read. And the second contention is that the title of this text is to be read in at least two ways. It's a statement of fact. Here is a relating of what has bound traditions and peoples together, while of course splitting and creating divisions. But it's also an imperative each of us is advised by Sayre to reread our own inheritances and to relive our commitments. There's a movement here then from indicating what has been done 
to a demand that the reader take account of what has to be done and of all of our roles in undertaking those tasks. Thank you very much. Do they look like the same book to you? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I can kick off um, John, it's a very pragmatic question. Um, it, it, it doesn't really skirt on what you were saying, but it's something that I think is probably important to us as, as a community of SARE scholars. It, it was almost a throwaway comment of yours, I think, um, that we, we, we ought to read SARE um, without incorporating him into a certain type of French theory. Um, and I'm without wanting to contest that at all on a theoretical level I'm, I'm also wondering eager for your thoughts on a practical level how to how Sarah can be made known to and introduced to new community of readers is, is there not a sense in which one one has to to some extent pitch him to a particular constituency and therefore try to to frame him in, in a particular way in order to, to help people see how he might be contributing to conversations that they're already part of? Or, or, or do you think that, that this imperative not to sort of present him as, as, as one more of these French philosophers trumps all of that? How would, how would you juggle those practical and those, those theoretical sort of demands and constraints? I mean, the stag about that thing called French theory was that it had always somehow uh, separated itself off from that domain called philosophy, which was sure that it didn't need to read any of this. Um, and of course, the other side of that move is to say, but all the same, um, I mean, say it doesn't fall on either side of an analytical continental philosophy divide. Um, and I think that's maybe the route um, by which to um, propose and affirm um, both the distinctiveness and the necessity to read. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of kind of curious that um, in order to contraband itself into North America. Um, French theory had, in some senses, to present it wasn't philosophy. <laughs> That's the sort of thing that it's strategic. Um, um, and of course, then you know, lots of people who called themselves philosophers um, made themselves look quite spectacularly idiotic by pretending to have read something they couldn't have read and making declarations about it, which um, irritated and um, seemed absurd by alternations. So. Um, learning, as it were, from that experience. <laughs> I mean, I think um, I think the conditions in the twenty twenties are not as polemical and hostile as they maybe were in the seventies. Um, I mean, I still cringe when the name Searle is mentioned for all the obvious reasons. Justifiably so. Um, because he's, you know, a classic case of somebody who thought he knew what could have been said and therefore didn't need to have read. So he's in the game of chess version of philosophy where I've covered all the bases already. So this is either agreeing with me or nonsense. It doesn't agree with me, therefore it's nonsense. Um, and it's a kind of move that um, perfectly instantiates the, the, the thought that the excluded third um, is, is a disaster for thought. Um, so probably, <clears throat> I mean, may, maybe the route would be to, you know, disavow, um, uh, or maybe the move would be actually to, to affirm that there are these two separated French traditions in, in philosophizing, one of which goes under the names variously of, um, you know, Derrida, Regret, Nancy, and another of which goes under a series of names, Carrières, Tanguy, and Bachelard. Um, uh, and to say that where the 
French reception seems to keep them apart. Um, one could have a Cersean reception that shows that he was sitting in the middle between them both and therefore treated with hostility by both. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, mm -hmm. he does seem to have been a writer who, you know, by turns is either ignored or treated with hostility. And, and that is so interesting, <laughs> granted his own um, analyses. So um, that maybe goes some way to... I actually haven't written the French theory remark into the paper, so you're absolutely <laughs> right to pick that up. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. I particularly appreciated the reflections on Seth and translation. I think, you know, having to always explain to people parasite means noise in French is one of the impediments you run into when you're trying to um, explain these concepts to uh, Anglophone audiences. Um, and then it, this is going to be more of a reflection. It just made me wonder how different the book would have been if it had been written in English with noise as its keyword or with something else. Um, because noise in some ways seems to pick up so many sad themes. One of the etymologies proposed is that it's from nausea, seasickness. Um, another is that it's from noxia to do harm. Um, I think Stephen Connor pointed out yesterday that the original meaning in English is actually sound of a musical instrument, and it's only later that it becomes quarrel or something unpleasant. Um, and it's a loan word from French, and so there's, I don't know, it seems like it would also be a wonderfully semantically rich word to, to develop these same concepts on, although some of the things that you get with parasitos you surely would lose with noise. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have much to say beyond that, but it, it did make me, I, I, I do kind of, it does seem very nice to think about Seah translation in that way um, and, to, and to kind of compare, I don't know, how these concepts move between one language to another. I mean, I, that's another stage in this, which I didn't read. I came up with the idea of suggesting it ought to have been called something like reading the relays, um, relays of readings. And that, but, but, but I mean, I can see the temptation was irresistible to put the word religion on the cover. And then, the, you know, there's a kind of attempt to suggest that it's not a straightforward religion because it's fractured into these four different chunks looking a bit like a Roman inscription. I mean, I take it, you know, they thought about this, but but then just to present it, I mean, this is, you know, kind of another question about the requirement that I believe is either from the foundation or from Michel Serre himself that he didn't want introductory materials to his text because they get in the way of the reading. But it seems to me that if you change a title in that kind of dramatic way, and another thing that the translator remarks on is that he strips out some of the subheadings, uh, supposedly in the interest of clarifying the distinction between the horizontal and the vertical. But it seems to me that the horizontal and the vertical actually is meaningless um, unless you build in. Um, uh, and so... I mean, I'll, I'll read his note because, I mean, it's important to be fair to him. I mean, he has done the work, you know. So, uh, I have streamlined the table of contents for the sake of clarity and consistency. Vera, where are you? <laughs> uh, seeking to bring out the main theme of each chapter. The various subsidiary themes involving the idea of hotspots, networks, or webs of relations false gods, love and death in relation to violence and so forth frequently recur in the section titles and no reader will fail either to understand their importance or to grasp their connection with one another. Um, well, I think he's very hopeful. <laughs> um, so um, one of my, as it were, hermeneutical questions was about this question of respecting the antipathy to footnotes and to editorial introductions. Uh, Stephen Connor wrote that so helpful introduction to the translation of five sentences, um, for example. I mean, it just depends who you get to do it. So, um, noise. Um, 
It's odd he didn't write a book actually called Noise. Mm. Uh, but it's... And then in English, you get... Uh, the one place where I find people referring to Seth is in commentary on viral media and the UC Perica talks about Seth in terms of why we have so many insect metaphors for technological breakdown um, and vice versa, technological metaphors for insects, things like bugs and computers and antennae and that sort of thing. Um, and so English does seem to produce plenty of examples that fall into the same lexical field and that fit with disease and maybe less so with hospitality, but that speak to a kind of continuity between biological and the, and the technological. Oh, thanks. Uh, could, could I just, um, I was really go back to what you were talking about just a moment ago about the sort of uh, the sort of synthesis aspects and Sayer's resistance to having introductions and what's fascinating about the two things you've focused on is they are they do have a lot of sort of syn synthetic work in them both the the conversations the sort of look back at you know where he was then and then similarly towards the end of the the religion book there's that looking back and. And he often seems to make that gesture in lots of books. It's in statues, in hominescence, isn't it, as well? There's often, well, actually, all of my books are about this, whatever this current book happens to be about. And then there'll be a sort of rereading of all of those books. And I, I wonder just what your reflections were on that kind of work of synthesis that Sir does, you know, maybe particularly across the religion book and the conversations book, but, but more generally about his own sort of also reflective sort of uh, bits of writing. The, the, the way in which he folds them back on each other. Um, what does uh, following through more rigorously? I mean, the list he gives at the beginning of chapter three. I'm not sure it's called chapter. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, is um, the Hermes volumes, Hominescence, Jean Racine 1. Uh, Hermaphrodite, 87, Légion des Anges, 93, uh, and the passage of the North West. Oh, and the Contrat Naturel. So, in fact, I have imposed Ecclesiasmore and Parasite. Um, Parasite he mentions later, but he doesn't put it in that list there. Um, so, Relil Relier, it seems to me, is saying, you know, in, in all of my books I have done this, I have um, reflected on where I have come from and suppose that that is um, constituting the forces within which I'm currently writing. Uh, and so, were we to take up the steering um, image, uh, he's steering the current book um, out of the false field, sort of. Uh, remain with him from the writing of the previous ones and the failures of arrivals at the previous ones uh, will have left him regretting. I mean, I, I would suppose it would go something like that. Uh, uh, can you get feedback loops in steering? I think he refers to that when he talks about the uh, the helmsman in the natural fact and the uh, fact that the steering the steering is achieved through uh, through the action on the on the waters through the gun air, but also responding to the action. There's a there's a loop going on. That's what I recall. And I don't have a text in front of me to check. That, that I was just thinking that that would give you a, a model of the reflection back of his previous work. It's really, Responding back through, coming back through him and the next one. Because it's the it, it it's it's not that there are two sets of forces that that there, there are this incredibly complicated set of turbulences oh, yeah. and backflows not just in the water but also in the air and not just in the air but also in the functioning of the engine. Granted that we've. Presumably, oh, maybe it's a nuclear powered submarine. Um, that would be a different kind of navigation. Um, 
that will permit you to go up and down too. Like this. Okay. Um, I found it a bit uncomfortable reading that book because of this horizontal and vertical. It just seemed very, very binary, very sort of dualistic, whatever, which of course he spent all his life going against. And I, I wonder what he thought about that. And I just sort of cringed a bit that it, it reminded me of a lot of philosophy. I mean, for some reason I thought about William Blake, not a philosophy of poet, but um, and about Satan and energy and uh, sort of a, in that sense against God and of course, uh, rational and so on. But, but that's Blake. But uh, did you find that yeah, that that that's why it seemed to me to be import, important to pick out that remark where he talks about the move from the plane of imminence, which would be the horizontal axis, to the volume of the vertical. And so to me there's the suggestion that I went back into the parasite to see whether I could fill this out. There's a suggestion that this horizontal plane of imminence is a domain of calculation of calculable forces, um, which is utterly inadequate <laughs> for the purposes of making sense of the relations within which we find ourselves in what we call the world or the planet or the globe, and that it's the volume of the vertical dimension with these movements up and down, which um, it turns out that Simon Weil is going to be able to help us with because the gravity that pulls downwards is counterposed by the force that is going to be called grace that carries us upwards. Um, and so to me it's a misfortune that that notion of volume, that the vertical is volume which would permit there to be a turbulence of forces within the volume as opposed to a calculable set of um, vectors in a single plane surface. So it may be that our horizontal axis is a sort of misguided conception of human relations as calculable forces with determinate relations and outcomes. And what's needed is a better understanding of the arrival of the disruptive moment, the that wonderful list of the spiritual, the virtual, the mathematical, the you know, to which one could add the musical. Um uh and so I, I wonder whether that's a possible way of, I mean, I had the same discomfort. Um, and yet it seems to me probable that, you know, it, it's such a basic piece of math. <laughs> um, you know, and then you, you, you draw the curves and you find you've got 10 dimensions um, and not just two or however many dimensions. Um, and so, I mean, Perhaps he's doing us the compliment of being more sophisticated mathematicians than I certainly am. Um, and so uh, when I leapt from the thought that he really doesn't think there's just a horizontal and a vertical plane, um, it, it, it occurred to me that there was, you know, that this is this is a many dimensional, um, how many variables do you want? Um, and so in a sense, the removal of the notion of the sommet de réseau is a problem because um, if you've got very complicated curves that are going in uh, dimensions that you can't plot in physical space, um, which I take it, you know, he would be thinking about as a normal course of events. Not my yeah. comfort zone, but mm. so the same discomfort, but I well, think um, that's the move to make yeah. that he's got a more sophisticated <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there is, uh, so for, for me, this conflict is the vertical and the horizontal. No, the, um, that is partly, I think, due to um, a very modern reception of what we call a Cartesian space, or the coordinated space for analytical thinking. But verticalities, even axis, of course, were characterizing philosophical thought way before the 17th century. And there it was, uh, so for example, Serres making 
many times uh, uh, this emphasis on the ancient tradition in meteorology, right? the meteora. And what you have there is the, the elements, fire, water, earth, and air, which in antiquity were understood to be bodies. But these bodies would never be pure, but always mixed. And they would transform, so that they don't come alone. No? So there is nothing which doesn't have a relation to the, to the others. And there are movements which go vertical, like when the water gets vapor and so on, or the clouds fall. So there are vertical movements and horizontal movements which are discretized, but they're not atoms because they're elemental. They're parts of these elements. So they, there is a bodily notion. And this is also where the notion of place as amphora in, in Aristotle is coming from. So there is there is a, a whole a whole tradition to 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 re re um, um, to re uh, aufdecken, no? So to 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 this to to, to uncover, <laughs> where specifically with regard to um, an ethics of virtues, there seems I don't know who whom the, uh, this was uh, made reference to, but I picked this up in some readings I had. There was an an a, a, a doctrine that was called axiology in antiquity. And what it mainly said is, with respect to values, there cannot be an order. So it's like the, this, this uh, triad with the good, the beautiful, and the true. They only make sense in constellation around an axis. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you try to say one is more important than the other, mm -hmm. you lose the glue of all of them. And the reasoning which goes with these constellations, where you cannot have an order relation, no? what, we, what we have inherited or make also what we want to read out of Descartes is that the axis give us order in the Cartesian space, the analytic space. But there was this whole tradition where the axis would precisely be what lets us not look for order relations. And order relations means um, middle ground ends, no? so, so fixed, fixed points. And this, I think, is very interesting to, 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 to connect to the to the the processes also that are uh, described then in in this meteorological tradition because they are processes that are circuitous they're not processes where one thing is transformed and comes out as another thing they are they are cyclical mm -hmm. and yet they are not they cannot be rationalized in one line mm -hmm. you know? so then you have for example the most interesting one and i think the one which was most puzzling was uh, rarefaction and it was what influenced the neoplatonists so much because rarefaction had something, how was that? This had something to do with how the, the minerals which were transported through the winds and the waters would coalesce and build sedimentations that is due to the meteorological streams, but they are just carried by it. One can't say they're caused by it. No? So, so, and then there is a kind of an, a dispersion. A, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't remember, but there are beautiful words <laughs> that help to imagine how a verticality and a horizontality, when we think it in relation to a cosmos, no? that, doesn't that doesn't represent, but, but gives us a model of the world, that get a very different scope of association than the one that we uh, all try to get rid of, no? which we call Cartesian. It's not the <laughs> It's very important, but we, it, yeah, we are. We are, we are the real two colleagues of the next Because the coordinates are called Cartesian, it means that he's blamed with the system. Yes, yeah. but Descartes wrote his book his book on the world as an optics. There's yeah. a treatise Descartes wrote, it's called Le Monde, Traité de la Lumière. Yeah? It's, a, it's, a, it's a book on light, which gives a model of the world, where the world is precisely not the empty container, but a plano. That's how, how, how Descartes calls it. It's a plano with tracks. And the cracks are such that the elements always fill it up, so we can never get the crack. And this was his way of getting around the theological problem to say there is a void. No, he says, only oh, virtually we need to assume, but it's only a virtual construction, like a point of origin, it's only a virtual construction. And then the world was, the model of it was a plenum, it was not an, 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 a, a vacuum, it was not an empty container, not at all. And the, and the coordinated space was actually where we can study what geometry is able to do empirically. So, so it's, it's very fascinating. This book, the introduction of it was the, the, the famous text, Discours de la méthode. And this discourse was to be applied to geometry. Mm -hmm. No, it was not that geometry gives us the method 
On the other way around, this method was to be applied when we try to reason geometry by calibrating it to the Meteora and the light uh, diffusion. I don't know why this book is so little received. I mean, it's not it clearly Sarah is thinking with further abstractions, which are not there in Descartes, and not saying everything we are looking for, we can find that, but it's a, the story is much more rich than we, than we, we don't, I don't think it helps us if we make such a straw man <laughs> of, of Descartes, no? And Simone Weil, her, her book on perception, which her thesis on Descartes, focused on the problem of perception, because with the Disco de la Method, there is a, something cognitive which gets in, 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 uh, um, inserted, because the optics in Descartes was not so much how is the nature of the eye and the nature of the light, but it's always what instruments can we devise that will facilitate a certain way of connecting the two. And these instruments, they today are super close to the things how we approach cognitive science. He's got a really interesting section at the end where he starts talking about the manner in which the connections, which in some places are made via thinking religious um, structures and religious images, are pursued in a different fashion, but all of them um, are replicated in the cognitive sciences. Um, and that move, I think, is extraordinary um, because he is, in a sense, uh, suggesting that uh, in the same kinds of ways in so many of the books, he's transposed a Christian Trinitarianism into uh, the various paganisms that have thought um, a tripartite forcing of meaning and uh, value in the uh, replications of uh, words such and uh, the frankincense more uh, gold trilogy, uh, that he's now suggesting that the religious impulse is to be found more in the cognitive sciences in their attempt to say everything about everything that there is. And in a sense, he's suggesting that we should follow them there. Uh, not that we should um, resist and say, oh, let's just stay with religion. Uh, it seems to me that the, towards the end of the book, he's 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 uh, saying here is a new mythology, um, which is more powerful in terms of permitting people to think about their futures in more uh, 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 humanely affirming ways. And I, I mean, I wondered what you thought about that section about. I, I don't remember the. Yeah, I did not yet carefully read the last book. Well, there's lots of reasons to read it again, and not least just stay in French. <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but uh, um, the, I mean, the cognitive, I, so, the, the, I mean, specifically in cognitive science, no, they work with the Cartesian space. Of the fact. Just like graphics and computer rendering, all of these computational things, they, they directly implement what they say in philosophy they want to overcome. Which is they don't need to if they have if they would have a, a, a quantum paradigm much more. I'm sure there are cognitive scientists which are different. And Malabu is making a great attempt to go in this direction. For example, with introducing the notion of plasticity in this richness as she does it. But we said there is even this this um this story where he speaks on literacy, no? where he says no, it's not a catastrophe that the computer can now better imagine than I can, and that the computer can better memorize than I can. It's just oh my God, look the faculties that enlightenment thought are genuinely human. I have it in my hand now, here in my laptop. It doesn't mean that the head is empty in the sense of there's nothing for it to do. It means now we can become inventive and develop our capacities in interplay with the old uh, uh, northern of it. But that is also not the same like a transhumanism where we would kind of leave the body and 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 uh, and become uh, a next order level. It's, it's just like... I was thinking change when printing press was there and books were not scarce and all of these things. It's normal illiteracy studies. No? So, so how the technical interventions co-enact with our habits of, of thinking and of reading. And we all know how adaptive our thinking is. I mean, if we, if we, if we remember, these things tell me a lot. No? It, give this to a three-year-old. How can they, I mean, how can you imagine that learning to read and to write will make your mind so quick? And it works. And even you will, not the same, but quite quite likely, no, when you read the same word. <laughs> so this is amazing. Our brains do it. It is amazing. So a Cartesian space of cognitive science that works analytically and wants to find the legitimizations as causes. How, yeah, I'm, I'm very sure Sarah did not mean this, huh? <laughs> you mentioned Malibu. Do you think she reads Sarah? 
I don't know. No, I don't think. I think it's the impression she does. I, I don't think so either, which is kind of weird, isn't it? Because um, the notion of plasticity I find so interesting. I mean, it's got quite a long back history. Um, uh, On that inconclusive question, <laughs> as, as advertised, may have to finish. Uh, <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you.